morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Stuart. Ah, good morning, everybody. Better, better. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, and uh, we got quite a bit planned for this morning's service. Uh, we've had an amazing uh, day yesterday um, as we kind of di- discovered a bit more of the prophetic, and we're going to be hearing again from uh, Kirsten Mucho. And so, a special welcome to Kirsten and Dalupo. Dalu- Dalu- Dalapo, sorry, I can never pronounce. My bad. Uh, special welcome to them both. Um, as they are here this morning, we are so blessed and privileged to have them in the house. Why don't we stand up together this morning? We're going to get into some time of worship together and uh, just spend some time worshipping our God in this place. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you so much that you are a good God. Lord, that you are perfect and you are awesome. And Lord God, that you are mighty and victorious, Lord Jesus. And Lord, that we can come to you this morning and we can offer a sacrifice of praise. And Lord God, we just pray, Father, that you would receive all the worship, all the glory, all the adoration. Lord, if there's anything this week that's distracting us in our hearts and our minds, that's overwhelming us, Father, may it fall to the ground. Father, that we may look to you, the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we may focus our eyes on Jesus the only true way, the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, we pray, Father, whatever is hindering us, whatever whatever is keeping us to the side, Lord Jesus, may we step out and may we step in and press in to who you are this morning, to all that you are, Lord Jesus, your perfect and amazing, awesome splendor. May it be seen and felt here this morning, we pray. We ask, Lord Jesus, let let us decrease and may you increase this morning. In the praises of your people, we pray in your name. Amen. Let's worship him. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 
Praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Oh, let it rise. Let praise arise. You sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Oh, let it rise, let praise arise, let it rise. We'll see you break down every wall, we'll watch the giants fall. The thing cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side, forever lifted high, with all creation cry. Let faith be the song that comes the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every This one. 
here. Amen. Amen. Give someone a high five before you sit down. Say welcome to church quickly. Awesome. Let's take our seats. So as I said yesterday, we had a, a, a prophetic workshop throughout the day and we were, uh, as adults, we were being trained and equipped on how to listen to the prophetic voice of God. And so I thought we could try and do a bit of listening with some of our kids today because our kids are great listeners, aren't they? Let's be honest. Let's be honest. So I think we could probably have maybe three volunteers, three kids volunteers. I know parents, you want to be involved, but... Uh, Anyone else? Anyone else? Come on. Uh, come on, Lily Midea, you come up. Uh, I need two more. Younger, younger, preferably. Two more, two more. Come on. Come on, Lucas. Don't let me down. Up you come, mate. One. That's the one. One more, one more, one more. Come on. Come on. Come on. Harry, come on. Uh, Phoebe, let's come, come, come. No. Oh, my days. Will, what do you do to get the kids to come? You're like a Pied Piper. Jasper, yay! He's hiding. Right, come. Okay, so what we're going to do under that table is a, a bunch of delights, a bunch of things that make noise, and I'm going to blindfold two of you, and you have to listen very carefully. So that means everyone needs to be quiet. It's going to be very difficult. You have to listen very carefully, and the first person to tell me what it is wins, okay? Yeah? Right, so... Let's put some blindfolds on. <laughs> I'm going to get you to do the noisy part because I know you're noisy. Right, I'm going to blindfold you. fine. It's really fine. Right, can you see anything? No. Okay. So you, you stand here. It gets too hot. I apologize. Uh, right. So we have some delights. So right. You ready? Listening. One each. Right, hopefully this one's a bit easier. You don't need to use it because it's my daughter's. That was a hint. It's something you use. Ready, go. Hey! Right. Okay, I'm trying to think of a really easy one. This should be hopefully very easy.
Right, this one's going to be a bit messy. Come on, you there. Crack, what goes crack? An egg, yay! Right, let's give our volunteers a round of applause. I'll get them. Maybe in theory should have gone for some slightly easier ones, maybe. Oh dear. Right, I think that was uh, pretty hard, so I think Jasper won because he's obviously looking very covered. <laughs> awesome. So why do we do that? Because, you know, one of the things that we can do is even as little children, even as kids, God encourages us to listen to him. And sometimes it takes a bit of hard work. Sometimes we don't actually know what we're listening to. We're not even sure what we can hear. Sometimes it's really, really difficult to hear God's voice. But he is faithful to always speak to us if we're willing to listen. You know, there's a story in the Bible where Samuel is in bed and he's sleeping and the God says to him, Samuel, he calls out his name. And Samuel doesn't realize that it's him, that it's God calling. And see, he runs to Eli and he says, Eli, I'm here. What do you want? He says, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed. And again, God says, Samuel, wake up. So Samuel wakes up and goes back to Eli and says, Eli, Eli, what's going on? What's happened? Eli's like, dude, shut up. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. So Samuel goes back to bed. And it, again, God says, Samuel, wake up. The third time, it happens again. And finally, Eli realizes when Samuel goes to him, he goes, I think God might be speaking to you. So he says, this time, go back. And when God says your name, say, yes, God, your servant is listening. So then Samuel ran back to bed, went to sleep. And soon enough, God went, Samuel. And Samuel woke up and said, yes, God, your servant is listening. And that's what we can do as no matter what our age, no matter how old we are, we can listen to God. And hopefully you'll be able to do a bit of that this morning as you go to kids' church. So we're going to release you guys to go. So why don't all of our kids and helpers stand up and we're going to pray for them as they go. Father God, we thank you for our children. We thank you for our children's workers. We just pray, Father, a blessing over them. We pray, Father, they would have a great time in creche and in blast. Lord Jesus, they would listen to your voice and hear from you today as well as we are this morning. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Sling your hook. Youth, you are staying in, but kids, you are going out. Awesome. Youth are staying in, mate. Legend. Living the dream. Right. It's that most exciting time, announcements, uh, notices. So I'm going to go very fast. If you are a first-time visitor this morning, welcome. We want to say a big welcome to you. There is a welcome desk out there. We would love to meet you and greet you, and you can find out a bit more about church and what we do. Um, We have our family cook and eat project starting tomorrow, which is basically identifying kids through the school that will come and cook with their parents, learning how to cook healthily and well and good, good, nutritious meals that they can take home and feed their families. So that's from three to six. If you can't volunteer, you can at least pray that God would really bless and impact these, these families and these children's lives. So that's tomorrow, three to six, for the next four weeks. If you can volunteer, speak to Will at the end of the service. Threads Breakfast, all the ladies go, woo Yeah, Threads Breakfast is on the 17th of June. Um, You can sign up online or at the welcome desk, and it's going to be a time for the ladies to meet together. This is my most exciting one. It's Kent's why I've worn this shirt. All Nations Sunday is coming. Come on. Woo! So we have All Nations Sunday. We did call it International Sunday, 
but we wanted to include the Brits. So we said all nations. So all nations Sunday. And it's going to be on the 25th of June and everyone is involved. Everyone's going to be having a great time. It's going to be a celebration of the, just what God is doing in the heartbeat of this church. And then there's a, the prophetic word that Kirsten's going to share with us, which really fits, I think, with what God is doing in our church in these days. And it, oh, we want to invite you to come. It's going to be a celebration, different languages, different songs in different languages, different prayers, all sorts. And then... The best part, okay, not the best part, because worshiping Jesus is the best part. But one of the good parts is we're going to eat together at the end, and it's going to be a celebration of the various nations around the world that are represented here in the church. So if you are British or Indian or African or whatever you are, you can represent, you can be an ambassador for the day. That's what we're asking you to be. We want you to be ambassadors. We want you to wear your best dressed outfits. We want to bring a food. If it's fish and chips, go for gold. Whatever it is, we want you to bring some food for our lunch so that we can share together and have a lot of fun. So that's on the 25th. If you want to sign up for that, come again to the welcome desk. And uh, yeah, lastly, just want to say thank you very much to everyone who gives so faithfully to the church, um, week in, week out, month in, month out. There are various ways in which you can give. We are, yeah, purely funded on the sacrifice and the giving of this amazing church. And, you know, the, again, the prophetic word is all about sowing. This church has sown for so long. And we're just believing that as we sow, we will reap a harvest of souls in Jesus' name. So please, keep giving, keep uh, giving to the, what God has to do in this church. I, I want to share a bit of time this morning. Um, we, as I said, we've had a great time over the weekend. And I'm going to ask a few people, if they're willing, just to share a bit of experience or, yeah, highlight over the last day. Any volunteers that came over yesterday morning or yesterday night? Anyone, anyone, anyone. Come on, who can I go to? Yes, Tola. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, so I was here for the morning um, session and for the evening one as well. And I was really blessed because um, um, I'm taking on a role as the prayer coordinator for the church. And a lot of things that weighed really heavily on my mind and my spirit, you know, were confirmed yesterday, you know, because I've been praying so hard to God, you know, to help me in this new role, you know, that he's placed me in. And I wasn't sure because I've been so overwhelmed and, you know, and um, so I've been praying. And all of them, I'm not joking, every one of those prayers were answered yesterday. It's really prophetic message and word, you know, that came um, from, um, from Kirsten and Dolapo and Hannah as well. So, yeah, so it, it's been amazing. It's kind of given me that bounce in my step now. And I know, you know, that God is with me and God is with the church as well. And what is doing to move the church forward. So I'm, I'm really grateful for that. So, yes, it was amazing. Thank you. Amen. Anyone else? Anyone else want to share? Sarah? Yeah. I know you're always happy to share. Um, so I had some lovely prayer with Hannah and she just really encouraged me in what I'm already doing but um, just a little challenge to myself was to really just sit in dad's lap and, and enjoy the relationship with the Lord for myself before I worry so much about other people. <laughs> so. Amazing. Cool. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? John Rice, you want to share something? Yeah. I think, I think for us, the blessing of the weekend was having Kirsten and Delapo stay with us. Mm. I think they really blessed us, having us, having them in our house. Mm. The things they shared with us, um, and it was just really important for us. It was really helpful. Amazing. Thank you. Amazing. Awesome. Awesome. I wonder if we can get Kirsten up, and she's going to maybe just share a bit of what she kind of, as a, then her and the team felt God was saying to us as a church, because we really feel that what she was saying was really on the money, it was spot on, and it's totally what God is saying to his church. Do you want this one? Or? I've put this one on, so thanks, thanks to it. Um, yeah, so just I think it's always helpful to have this as a reminder but one of the words I felt God just want to remind you guys is that you have a firm foundation in this church and that things may change things may evolve seasons may come and go but you have a firm foundation and he reminded me of this scripture from Psalm 40 which um, says he has set my feet in a firm place in a secure place and I just encourage you that whatever 
whatever evolves and changes as time goes on, that you have such a good, firm foundation in this house. And that is reflected in your leadership as well. But I think Stuart really wanted me to share um, just what I felt God put in my heart that linked to this incredible initiative about being all nations. Um, I've come to Buckskin over the years and I've seen an increasing diversity in this community and that has made my heart glad um, because we are better together um, and we are better when we come together to reflect the diverse beauty of the Church of God in, in all its uh, multitude. And I felt the Lord say this to me yesterday morning. He said, you have been a church with a heart and investment into the nations. For years and years, for generations, you have sown into nations. And by sown, S-O-W-N, like reap, like sowed seeds into nations with your investments, with how you invested in people, with how you've gone and with what you've done. And for many years, you've sown into those nations. But now is the time where I am going to bring the nations back into the house. And I'm going to sow, S-E-W, them into the fabric and the DNA and the essence of my body here. And I want to sew them in so that they reflect my glory. And he felt there was this this encouraging word to sow as, as he draws the nations into you here at Buckskin, that you will sow them into the very fabric at every level, right? Decision making, service, worship, prayer, like whichever area, but that they would be literally sewn in to the fabric of who you are. Because I felt he then say, because then you will be a shining light of what it is to be my people a people of diverse race and ethnicity and love that reflects my glory in a nation where tolerance is shrinking and where intolerance is growing and where we're becoming more closed than we've ever been and more self-protective than we've ever been. But will you, this is the opportunity for Buckskin to model what it is to be the inclusive church of God and the richness and the diversity and the beauty that that brings to a nation. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship now as we kind of, you can ponder on those words, but just exciting to to know that God is in the business of building his church. And all the years of sowing faithfully, God is going to sow in a beautiful tapestry for all to see. Why don't we stand up together as we worship now? We're going to sing a couple of songs together and spend some time in worship. And we're going to sing and bring uh, just a sacrifice of praise and as we do it we're also going to have our offering so our stewards could serve us in this first song that would be great take around the offering bags and just give that opportunity for us to give back to God in our way of giving let's pray
song we could ever sing. I'm worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. I'm worthy of every breath we could ever bring. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, I'm worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you.
that's just standing here this morning, if you want to just lift up your voices to our Father God. He is our firm foundation. Never, ever leave him. We'll always hold your hand. We'll always be there for you. Let's do that this morning. We're going to do it in song. We're going to do it in words. And then we're going to go into a fantastic new song. That's where we're standing now. Just thank our Father God. Like 
Father God, we thank you that although sometimes we might feel like ruins, although sometimes we don't feel like we're good enough, Lord God, sometimes we feel like we're too far away from you. Lord Jesus, that you make all things beautiful. You make all things perfect. And Lord God, that you will build your kingdom here in our lives and in this church. And Lord, as Kirsten comes to share the word today, Father, I pray an anointing. I pray an equipping on on, on her, Lord God. Lord, I pray, Father, give us the ears to hear, Lord God, what you want to say to each and every one of us today. Lord God, incline our ear to the Father heart of God this morning, we pray, that we may listen attentively to what you want to say, oh God, in your holy and precious name. Amen. Let's take our seats. Thank you very much for the incredible opportunity to be back with you. It's such a joy and a pleasure to share and um, such a privilege to be here. We had a fantastic time yesterday. It was a really special time together. And so thank you to you as a church family and also your incredible leadership here for allowing us the space and time to be with you. It's been a real privilege. Um, As we come together this morning, um, and as I was preparing, I know it says I'm speaking on the prophetic, but I actually felt the Lord prompt me um, a few months ago to speak from Psalm 23. And this is a psalm that is well known and loved. We know it very well. Um, But it is a particular psalm with real timeliness and prophetic poignancy for this season. And so um, I want to share a word that is a prophetic word in season on how we can do this very thing, how we can build our lives for his kingdom in the midst of what looks like ruins. And so thank you for choosing that song. I was almost undone. I haven't heard it before, but it was a beautiful setup uh, for this morning. 
This psalm holds truths and points us to practices that anchor us in this time and enable us to be signposts of hope. Um, there's a prophetic lady in, this, in, this, in the UK called Rachel Hickson, and she uses this phrase for the church in the UK right now, will we be signposts of hope? And I have got hold of that, and I love it, because if there's any place we want people to be coming, it's to Jesus and to his church for hope in this time. Because I think, arguably, you'd all agree that we are experiencing a fair amount of turbulence, right? There's shaking, there's chaos, there's confusion, there's even a great deal of fear. Finding ourselves in the long-term effects of a global pandemic, the post-pandemic mental health crisis, economic crisis, war in Ukraine, global migration and immigration, uh, confusion and, and um, aggression in some places. We have a cost of living crisis. And if that wasn't enough, they're telling us we now have a climate catastrophe. You know, all of these words are even just in themselves, like let's use crisis, let's use catastrophe. Um, and so we just find ourselves just in this time of turbulence and shaking. And I think many of us thought, okay, with pandemics over, phew, right? But that's not where we found ourselves. We found ourselves in a continually disruptive and uncertain time. And on top of that, um, we're hearing lots of stories of abuse and uh, misuse of power in our churches, influential leaders who are, um, their news is coming out about really the depths of how they haven't loved as Jesus loved. And that can be quite disruptive in and of itself and can make us think, man, what are we doing here? And as I was reflecting about this turbulence, um, I was reminded that in recent months I've done a number of plane journeys, both for personal and work reasons. I'm not proud of my carbon footprint, but um, they have been necessary for, re for various reasons. And one was a trip I took with my husband, Oscar, who I love and is my best gift um, and my treasure after Jesus. He and I got to go home to Rwanda after four and a half years to visit family. And um, we had a wonderful time. But during these flights, um, I was reminded about just the regular occurrence of turbulence and how much that disrupts. And, um, you know, we all know that familiar if you've been on a flight. Uh, ping, ping. Hello, this is your captain speaking. I have turned the fasten seat belt sign on. Uh, we are about to enter some turbulence. Please remain in your seat and do not use the lavatories at this time. And as the ping ping goes and the announcement's released, you see a range of reactions in the cabin, right? There's those who fell asleep as you took off, right? And they're like, out for the count. They're the ones I'm slightly jealous of because I really struggle to sleep on flights. And so I'm like, oh, darn it. Um, and they're not phased at all. They're out for the count. Don't even know what's happening. You've got me who sits in that mildly frustrated camp of, oh, I've got to put my seatbelt over my blanket because otherwise the steward or stewardess is going to come and wake me up in the five precious moments I've managed to fall asleep. Or, oh, now they're not going to bring my tea or coffee. Or, oh, now I've spilt it over me. That kind of reality. Then there are those who kind of nervously start checking for the exits. Is the nearest one in front of me or is it behind me? Because they suddenly realized they weren't listening when the steward gave the safety announcement. <laughs> and then there's those who grab the sick bag. And they're like, where is it, where is it? They've gone a shade of green. And you're like, oh, Lord Jesus, let it not be projectile vomiting. <laughs> and you're like, let me not be too close. Um, and then you have those who are just terrified and think, this is it, it's all over, we're going down. And they're like holding onto the seat arms, their knuckles are white, and you're just like, they're just praying to Jesus for the first time in their lives because they're like, oh no. And I'd like to suggest that these responses that you see in a flight at a time of turbulence is what we see in our world yeah. right now. We see it in our communities, we see it in our institutions, we see it in our governments, we see it in the nations, and we see it in the church and in our lives. 
I'd like to suggest that although we have feet planted on terra firma, the turbulence and the response is similar. And Psalm 23 opens with this truth. It opens with the truth, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. It is a faith declaration amidst the turbulence and uncertainty that he is the Lord who is in ultimate control and is sovereign. When we say the Lord, we say the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Lion who sits, of the, li- the Lion of the tribe of Judah who sits on the throne. He is the Lord. Not Richie Sunak, not Trump, not any power or principality, but the Lord God Almighty. The Lord is my shepherd. And we say he is my shepherd. There is a prophetic declaration that he is my shepherd. And as we articulate that, we are making a faith declaration that I am not in control. I can't fix this. I am not going to get my household out of an economic crisis. I am not going to solve world peace, far less peace in my home sometimes. But he is my shepherd. And there's a surrender And there's a submission and an acknowledgement of who he is. And he's the shepherd. He's the protector. And he's the provider. And so we have this incredible invitation at the opening start of Psalm 23 to be a people of faith declaration who will consciously pray and declare moment by moment, day by day in this season, the Lord is my shepherd. And this has become a meditation and a mantra that I think we should be repeating over and over again in our homes, in our workplaces, and in our spaces. Because as we do, we shift the atmosphere. And we make a different declaration to the spiritual realm that the Lord, the King of Kings, is our shepherd, the protector, and the provider. Not government, not my workplace, not the NHS. And so I would like to encourage us into a practice of faith declaration with this truth as an act of war in this season amidst the turbulence. If we can do that, we release peace. But then it moves on, um, Psalm 23, to an invitation. And this invitation is a wonderful one to rest and to restoration. A lot of what we've seen during the pandemic and and ongoing has left a lot of people exhausted and weary. Um, I don't know about you, but towards the end of the, the main part of the pandemic, I had started getting physical exhaustion features. I developed vertigo, I was exhausted, and one of the things that had gone was my ability to dream. I actually didn't know what my dream was anymore. I kind of was like, I'm just doing. And this is an invitation by the Good Shepherd to those of us who've come to a place of weariness and tiredness, to a place of green pasture where our vision and our hearts and our soul will be restored. And that restoration is for those who are weary and tired, but it's also for those who need healing and wholeness. And it's also for those who need provision because we are called into a place of green pasture right? As we know, a place of rich provision, a place where he has more than enough. There is a green pasture of plenty for us. But we have to lie down in it. And I'd like to suggest that a lot of us right now are not lying down in his green pasture. I don't know about you, but for me, it's much easier to run around and try and fix and solve and do things than it is to lie down in the presence of my good shepherd and be still. And that, I, that um, action of lying down is an act of surrender. It's an act of saying, Jesus, I am not in control. I can't fix this, but you can. And I choose to lie down 
and receive your strength and promise. So can you just turn to the friend next to you and can you just say, you have permission to lie down if you want to. I love the message version of um, this. It actually says, you let me catch my breath. And I think in our world right now, I mean, it can be really hard to catch our breath. And I love that, that when we lie down in green pastures, it gives us the opportunity to catch our breath. But it also invites us to... Um, be beside quiet or still, as some translations say, waters. And I think this is a very special invitation because if you go to a rushing river or a raging sea, you can't see anything in the sea, right? All you can see is the waves and the disruption and the turbulence, okay? But if it's a still and quiet place, as you look into a still water, you see your reflection, And as I was praying about this, I felt the Lord say, there's two invitations from this reflection. In the still place, or in the still place, when you see your reflection, it's an opportunity to stop and to come face to face with your inner world. It's an opportunity to come face to face with the places deep inside of us where maybe wounds and hurt and pain have got in, maybe where bitterness and comparison and disappointment have crept in, maybe where even some of the scarcity mentality that we see all around us, there isn't enough, we've got to keep it within our own nation because if we share, we don't have enough. There's a real strong poverty mentality and scarcity mentality about right now. Or maybe it's the spirit of offense. Well, I, I just, you should just do it this way. And because you're not, I'm doing my own thing. That is rife post-pandemic. The spirit of offense is rife. The other one is entitlement. And maybe some of this stuff has got into us, not intentionally. Sometimes it does intentionally, if we're honest. I'll put my hand up, right? But sometimes it's just because it's all around us. And it's not until we stop and we allow Jesus to let us see ourselves and the Holy Spirit to highlight those places within us that we give him an invitation to come and heal, to forgive to renew and to restore. And there might be some ruins, as we've sung about, in our lives that we don't even really know about. And there might be some that we do know about. And this is the invitation to come to the good shepherd whose promise is wholeness so that we can release that into our world, not exaggerate it in our world. And secondly, I'd like to suggest that it's um, linked to another scene that's a dear one of mine from one of my favorite cartoons, The Lion King. This is a moment um, Simba, the little cub, ran away from the pride and the devastation and the destruction that his uncle had caused. As a little cub, he ran away thinking, I'm not big enough, I can't solve this. Oh, it was all my fault. He runs away in shame. I was to blame for my father's death. I did it. It's all awful. And he just runs away. There's nothing I can do about it. And I'm only this little kid anyway. And as he runs, he finds this oasis. And he comes to the water, this still water. And as he looks into the water... And you can hear her, you you know he's thinking, I'm going to see this picture of this little cub, right? I'm going to see my little self. And then this image of a growing lion comes back to him. The image of his face, his father's face, Mufasa. And it's a face of strength, a face of authority, a face of power, and a face of um, destiny. 
And in that moment, Simba has a revelation that he is not who he thinks he is. He has a revelation from the reflection that he is strong, that he is mighty, that he has a voice, that he has authority, and that he has a destiny. And I'd like to suggest that this invitation from the Good Shepherd to still waters is for some of us to come and have revelation of how he sees us not how we see ourselves. Because as we live in this world from the place of how he sees us, we will change destinies. We will be kingdom shakers. After this revelation, Simba goes back and he restores his tribe and the space into a place of bounty. And so can I encourage us to get into the practice of stillness? It's a discipline. And I've started this year or a little bit towards the end of last year to just take five or ten minutes every morning to just be absolutely silent. I'm not talking. I'm just silent with Jesus. And allow him to steady my soul, to bring anything to the surface that he wants to deal with, but also to tell me who I am so that I can live from that place in this world. It's a beautiful invitation. Then we have the path, and the path is the promise that the good shepherd will uh, will guide us in paths of righteousness, right? And um, I think we'll all agree that the church has spent quite a lot of time on personal holiness and what you should or you shouldn't do, and there's a place for that. But this path of righteousness is about justice as well. It's about walking justly and in mercy with our God. But this can be challenging and overwhelming right now. There's so many voices, influences, and choices and opinions around. So how do we know his perfect pleasing and perfect will and the way of God in our world? I don't know about you, but even in the midst of strikes in our nation right now, there's a sense of justice, like we're not treating people fully fairly and people aren't getting, and there's a cost of living, and we need to fix some things that are wrong in our institutions. But there are times when it's tipping over into entitlement. Like some of the salaries I was hearing people asking for, I was like, we're in a global economic crisis. Who do you think you are? And that's not said in judgment, it's said in caution. Because very quickly, we can slip into a spirit of entitlement, not a spirit of justice. And I think we need to be discerning and sharp to know what we are seeing and how do we respond to it. We have issues of institutional sexism in all of our institutions. We have issues of institutional racism in all of our institutions. How do we walk justly? How do we be anti-racist? How do we walk out justice? And in so doing and being inclusive and accepting and making sure everyone does feel loved and honored because they are Jesus' craftsmanship and they are loved in his eyes, Where do we slip into your right conflicts with my right and causes other problems? And we're seeing that even now with the transgender movement where women are competing against biological men and losing in sports. Or where we're contemplating putting a rapist, a transgender man, into female prisons. Where's the line? How do we navigate it? It's more complex than it has ever been. It's not as simple as we've any ever known. And so we need to be coming to the path, Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, and saying, Jesus, what do you say about this? What do you feel about this? What is your heart in this situation? And how do you want me to live in integrity and love in this And he gives us that promise of the path. And then as we move towards our close, we come towards the valley. And this is the verse that talks about, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. 
your rod and your staff, they comfort me. There is little doubt that we are in a dark season in our nation and the nations at this time. There is little doubt that as much as that's happening at the macro level, I'm sure it's happening in some of our lives personally. I don't know all of your stories, but I imagine there are personal valleys some of you are walking through. This is a real part of our journey. It varies in degrees and seasons, but it's real. But there are three truths in this verse that encourage us in that place of the valley. The first is, it's only a shadow. Can you turn to your friend and say, it's only a shadow. The, the bark of the valley is not as bad as the bite. It is the valley of the shadow of death, but it is the valley of the shadow of death. And sometimes we get overwhelmed and the enemy comes in and he intimidates and he exaggerates. This is awful. It's terrible. God has left you. How could this happen? There's no way out. It's a cost of living. There's just nothing we can do. You know, he is 101 brilliant at intimidation and exaggeration. <laughs> and when he's doing that and he's loud in my ear, one of my favorite weapons is, it's only a shadow. It's only a shadow. You can't touch me. The victory is won. Jesus hold the keys. This is only a shadow. And it's a place of no fear. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the brand of clothing, No Fear, um, but it was like a surfer brand for those who are surfers in the room, and extreme sports, right? Like, No Fear, we'll take it all on, we'll go all out. And my suggestion in the valley is that Jesus invites us to put on the clothing of No Fear, for he is with us, and perfect love casts out fear. Now, don't misunderstand me. We all, there are mental conditions and health um, conditions that need to be treated, and those are things that we learn to live with. But even in that place, we can still put on this spiritual clothing of no fear, yeah. the spiritual truth that perfect love casts out fear. Oh. During 2 a.m. till 4 a.m. is when fear in this nation will come hard at you in the night. And for those of you who maybe have any discerning spirits and get woken up and you're like, oh, there it is. Perfect love. I declare perfect love. I declare peace. I declare the Prince of Peace. I put on the clothing of no fear. Because the Prince of Peace has the government on his shoulders. And the third truth is, it's where he is. He is present in the valley. And some of us will hear the enemy going, you're on your own. He's left you. There isn't, you know, like if he was God, he'd have done something differently. He'd have turned this around. He hasn't answered your prayer as you thought he should. But that's not truth. The truth is he is a good shepherd and his rod and his staff are right there comforting and strengthening and guiding us through the valley. And I want to give two examples if that's okay this morning. One is these are to share how when we find this truth in the valley and we walk through the valley in this truth, we see the overflow of his provision and his protection, and it's where the miracle touches earth. One is a story from Ukraine. And there was a woman when the war started in Ukraine who had one bag of pasta, one kg, right? You know those ones. And she prayed, she was a woman of faith, and she said, Jesus, I will feed as many people as you send me for as long as this bag of pasta lasts. The bag of pasta lasted two weeks, and she had tens of tens of tens of people come through her home. 
tens of tens of tens of people for 10 days, two weeks on one bag of pasta. The widow's oil comes in the valley. Provision comes when there's nothing more to give. And I'll share my story. I had a very deep valley for a few years And um, it's one of those where on the first year, God was like, this is the year of Job. And you're like, okay, I'm in for, I'm in for a treat this year. <laughs> and the second year, he said, this is the year of sifting like Peter, like wheat. And in those two years, we found out we couldn't have children. We found out that even with trying different possibilities, that was not God's will for our lives. And there was, gross, there was loss, and there was grief, and there was sadness, and there was devastation, and there was disappointment. And there was brokenness. And I need you to know, I am content, and Oscar is content. He has brought us to a safe place, to a spacious place, to a firm place. And we are really happy to not have children because he is showing very clearly that's not at the moment in his plan for us. But in that season, it was in the crisis of it, right? When it was raw, when we were figuring it out, and when grief was just overwhelming. There are moments of grief now, but it was overwhelming. In the midst of that, Oscar climbs 10-foot scaffolding in our church in Rwanda, and he falls onto solid concrete. And I'm closest to the scene. I'm one of the first ones who gets called to see him, and I run to find him with a hematoma the size of a baseball on his head, His hand is hanging off with an open fracture, and his leg is squinched. And in that moment, I go, Jesus, I don't know if he's going to make it. And at that moment, all I could pray was crisis prayers, right? Sometimes in the valley, it's like, help Jesus, help Jesus. I trust you, you're in control, but help Jesus. But the miracle that happened that night is unmistakable. Oscar fell. My mom sent a message to a friend who was another Christian in the city who was in a prayer meeting with the wife of the only neurosurgeon in Rwanda. She sent a message to her husband to say, get to the hospital now. He was at the hospital just after we got there. God was on his case before we even got to the hospital. God placed someone at the hospital who literally accelerated them through. He was like, right, you need to do this scan. You need to get him into this. You need to do this, and we'll do this in time. The orthopedic surgeon was already in surgery. As soon as he finished his surgery, Oscar was put in. He was within an hour of losing his hand. Only God in a developing country can do that. And as he came out of surgery and he finally settled that night, in the night, it was about two or three in the morning, his breathing finally began to settle. And his oxygen levels began to settle. I, some, I then was able to move to a prayer of, help me, Jesus, to, Jesus, where are you? What are you doing? This is a valley. Just show me where you are. And he said to me, he said, Kristen, my angels caught him. I commanded my angels concerning him. And by that stage, the only explanation for Oscar's injuries was the angels had caught him. He should have been paralyzed, dead, or something close. Because in the place of the valley 
is the place of the miracles. And that's what's exciting in this season and this generation. We are setting ourselves up for miracles, for more. And I am excited to see as our ch as with church walks into the promise, what God will do as man comes to the end of himself. And one of the ways we do this is we practice the practice of gratitude. Because the practice of gratitude in the valley is what welcomes the presence. Psalm 104 says, um, sorry, Psalm 100 verse 4 says, for the Lord, um, oh, now I've, <laughs> sorry, apologies, yeah. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. The way we enter his presence, the way we see his presence, the way we are open to sense his presence in the valley is through gratitude. It's through praise. It's through what we were doing this morning. The message version says, enter with the password, thank you. The, and the passion translation says, password of praise. The password of praise brings you right into his presence. And I learned this in my valley. Right around the time of Oscar's accident and our infertility, God said to me, Kristen, give me 10. And I was like, what, like press-ups, 10? Like literally on my knees, 10? And he was like, well, you could do those. And he's like, no, I want 10 gratitudes. I want 10 things you're grateful for. And I was like... Lord, I'm not sure. <laughs> There's like a lot I'm disappointed about. There's a lot I'm grieving over. There's a lot I'm not sure about. He's like, give me 10. So I was like, okay. I was like, I'm grateful I'm alive. I'm grateful I have a roof over my head. I'm grateful I have a job. I'm grateful I have food on my table. I'm grateful I have a husband who loves me and who's alive. I'm grateful that you love me, Jesus. And even when I don't feel you, you are present. I'm grateful that you are writing a bigger story than I can see right now. I'm grateful that you are faithful. I'm grateful that you are strong. <laughs> I'm grateful that you are comfort. And as I did my 10, and sometimes it was more than once a day, his presence would renew my spirit and would renew my hope and would allow me to still be a source of hope to those around us. One of the greatest testimonies was I was not going to let our story make me so caught up in myself I couldn't overflow to others. And that practice of gratitude invited the opportunity for me to move away from myself and looking at myself into the overflow of blessing into the lives of others. Because he has prepared, and this is where we close this morning. Thank you for listening so kindly. He has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He anoints our heads with oil my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because the truth in the turbulence is, we have a feast in front of us, a victorious one. The truth in the turbulence is that we are anointed with oil, protected, commissioned, and provided for to empower others. The truth in the turbulence is that we have an overflowing cup of his abundant, generous, miraculous provision of hope and blessing. And it is a continual overflow. As I give, he gives more. The truth in the turbulence is that goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of his life and will leave a trail behind us for others to see and follow of his goodness and of his mercy. And so can you stand for me as the band starts to play? 
there is a prophetic cry over the church and God's people in this season to be Goshens. You see, the place in Egypt that was Goshen was the place of fertility, of rich, fertile soil and of abundance. And there is a lot of lack now, but there is a Goshen when he is present. When the Israelites, when um, Moses came and they were the, the curses over Egypt, it said there was no light anywhere, but there was light in the homes of the Israelites. It said that there were curses and boils everywhere, but they were not touching the homes of the Israelites. And there is a prophetic cry over us as his body to be Goshen's, to be places where we are light in the darkness. Our households hold light, where we have provision and storehouses that overflow for others. And so I just want you to ask Jesus in your spirit now, Jesus, how do you want me to be a Goshen, a place of provision and light and overflow in this season? Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you are the Lord, King of kings and Lord of lords. We thank you that there is truth to carry us through the turbulence. And we hear your invitation to overflow. We hear your invitation to be light, to be truth, and to be hope. Lord Jesus, for each one of us in this room, show us how we can be Goshens, how we can overflow. Amen. Let's sing that song again that we sung earlier, Foundations. It's just so fitting.
God are in the business of building us up. Lord, you are in the business that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Lord, I pray right now for anyone here who is feeling like they are walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Father, that they would have a confidence to know that it is only a shadow. That death cannot touch them. Death cannot hold them. For it is only a shadow. And Lord, that you ultimately have the victory over death and its grave. Father, we pray right now that you would continue to build your kingdom in our lives and in your church, we pray. Father, that we would be a light in the darkness. We would be salt and light. We would be hope in a nation. That we would be your people and that you would build your kingdom here. Have your way, we pray. Jesus name. Amen. The team are going to continue to where to play and worship. If you would like to have prayer, you are more than welcome to come forward. I know the Lapa and my and my sister and I'm sure the elders would love to pray with you if you would like prayer. There was a lot spoken about this morning which we can deal with and we can lay at the foot of the cross and we can say, Jesus, take it from me. Help me through this valley of the shadow. Otherwise, please, if you have children, please don't leave them here. We love them, but please take them home and collect them from kids. That would be great. Otherwise, church, we love you. 
we are so blessed by all of the, all that God has brought into our fold. And we just want to say that we love each and every one of you. And we pray that God's favor and blessing will be upon you this week. And that even if you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you will fear no evil. Because he is with you. We love you, church. Tea and coffee is served. If you can help, please join in. There's a couple of people missing in that team. So if you want to help serve, please serve. Otherwise, stay here. We're going to worship him together.